Welcome everyone. Uh, this lecture is about survival analysis. Uh, this is a, a chapter we've added to the second edition of our book, uh, to chapter 11 of the book. This is kind of a special topic, but a topic that's a, a more, more and more interest in statistical and machine learning. So I think, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So what is survival analysis? It's, it concerns a special kind of outcome in which the outcome variable is a time until an event occurs. For example, suppose we've conducted a five-year medical study in which patients have been treated for cancer. We want to fit a model to predict the patient survival using features we know about the patient, such as their health measurements or the type of treatment, which so far sounds like a regression problem, which we've covered quite a bit in the course already. But there's an important complication here. Some of the patients hopefully have survived until the end of the study. Such a patient survival time is called, is said to be censored. And that causes problems, doesn't it, Rob, if the, if the observations are censored? Well, it causes problems because sometimes the, the uh, as high, you know, 70 or 80% of the patients are censored. We don't want to throw away that data. That's a lot of information because it's sort of partial information, right? The fact they survived at least five years uh, tells us something about the patient and about their features. So we want, we want to make good use of that information. So we've put here some big names in the field, which will, we're going to cover some of the, the, uh, the, the techniques that they've developed. You hear about the Kaplan-Meier curve, which was developed by the gentleman in the top left in the 19, about 1959. The bottom left, Mantel and Hansel developed the log rank test, which we'll see as a way of comparing two populations in survival. David Cox on the top right is responsible for the famous proportional hazards model. And actually elsewhere in the course, you'll see that uh, Trevor and I uh, had an interview with David in which we asked him about the history of the paper and survival analysis, which was a lot of fun. So that, that module will be in, in this chapter's um, uh, right. videos, right. Um, along with some of the other videos of famous people that we have throughout the course. And the bottom right is actually, looks, looks like a little fish out of water because he's in color. Terry Thurno was actually a classmate of Trevor and I at Stanford in the 80s and is responsible for the survival package in R. Now, if he knew that we put him up here along these other giants, he'd be quite embarrassed. But we put him there because we, we want to emphasize the importance of software, right? Software is, is really has the details of how to do something, and Terry's done a very careful job of, of imp implementing survival analysis of all kinds in the, in the survival R package. And he's done this for, what, 20 or oh, more years? Forever. Yeah. And Rob, you said in the 80s, that can't be. That's like 40 years ago. We can't have been at graduate school 40 years ago. I don't believe it either, but no. I think it might be true. Uh, oh. we bear that. We're going to have to check up on that. Okay. So now survival analysis originated largely in medicine, but there's applications in other areas wherever there's a censored outcome. For example, s suppose a company w wants to model churn, the, the event when customers cancel a subscription to a service, right? Uh, the company might collect data on customers over some time period to try to figure out which customers have the highest chance of canceling the service. Now, if, when does a study, presumably not all, not all customers have canceled their subscription by the end of the time period, and for such customers, the, the time to cancellation, that's the event here, is censored. So, and, and on that topic, if, if the company can predict well who is likely to churn, they can do something, right? They can call you up and maybe give you some special offers to, to keep you in, if it's a credit card or whatever, to, to keep you in the, in the company. So survival analysis is a, is a well-studied topic within statistics. It's been that way for you know, 50, 60 years, but it hasn't got that much attention in the machine learning community, but it, it is becoming more and more popular and important. Okay, so let's get started here. So for each individual, which could be a person or an observational unit, we suppose there's a true failure or event time. It's called failure if the event is something, if a part failing or someone dying, or maybe some other event. And as well, there's a, a true censoring time for that individual. And the survival time, it represents a time at which the interest, or the, the event of interest occurs, such as death. By contrast, the, the censoring is the time at which the censoring occurs. For example, if a patient drops out of a study or the study ends before he or she has the event, that's the censoring time. Some notation that the true survival time we'll call T, and the true censoring time we'll call C for that individual. And what we observe is the minimum of the two, right? If, if the failure occurs before the censoring, we get to see it. Otherwise, we get to only know the censoring time. And we'll call the minimum Y. That's our observed survival time. We want to know whether that survival time is actually a true time or whether it's censored. And the indicator delta we'll use is one if, it's a, if T is less than C, so it's a, an actual observed failure, or zero if it's censored. 
Okay. So you need to know delta and y to really understand the nature of the response. Exactly. And our, so our data typically from, for a training set consists of n pairs of y and delta, uh, one for each observation. So here's the, an illustration. And you can see here, so there's four patients and the solid circles are, are failures or deaths. So patient three died here, patient one died here. There's actually two different sort of kinds of censoring here. Uh, this patient was censored because the study ended. This patient was censored because he or she dropped out of the study for some reason. And these are, these are both censoring events. Okay. So a closer look at censoring. Do we have to worry about the censoring, whether it's gonna bias our analysis. Suppose a number of patients drop out of a cancer study because they're very sick, right? So they, they drop out early, right? Not because they die, they just yeah. don't want to come in and be measured and so on, they just... Don't want to come in, maybe they move to a different city to get other treatments, maybe they're too sick to come in, lots of reasons, right? If we don't take into, into consideration the reason they dropped out, then we'll have a bias. So the survival time will actually be overestimated, right? Because we'll assume they're censored as opposed to they died. If a lot of patients were very sick and were gonna die early and we, we treat them as this regular censored, then there'd be a bias. Similarly, for comparing, say, males to females, and males were, were more likely to drop out of the study because they're sick, we would conclude that males survive longer than females. But in fact, the male advantage there would be due to the fact that a lot of the sick males dropped out of the study. So we have to worry about a bias due to censoring. How do we do that? Well, in general, we have to assume that conditional on the features that we observe for each individual, the event time t is independent of the censoring time. So given the features, there's no correlation between the actual event time and the censoring time. And the examples above that, that violate that, right? Because we said, for example, someone, if someone's more sick, is gonna lead them to, to drop out, those two events are not independent, the censoring and their survival time. And this can be a nuisance, hey, Rob. Right. I mean, it's very convenient to assume this, make this assumption, right. but you really need to check it each time right. to make sure it's okay. And there's not really a way to check it statistically. Typically, you want to talk to your investigators, the people who ran the study you're, you're working with, and, 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 and find out the reasons why, why observations were censored. Um, so it's more of a, a detective search, and it's not, not so statistical, but it, one needs to make that assumption in order to proceed. Okay, so we have the survival data. What do we do with it? Well. So the, the, the basic item, one, the, the summary one makes is called the survival curve. Survival curve is the, the probability that the true survival time is, t is greater than some fixed number t. It's a function of, of time. And it decreases, of course, because as t gets larger, the chance of surviving past t gets lower. So for example, so, suppose you're interested again in the churn example, and then if t is the time until a customer cancels a subscription to the service, then the survivor function is the probability that a customer cancels later than time t, right? The larger the value of t, the less likely the customer will cancel before time t. Okay. We're going to be throwing a, a number of new definitions to you, so uh, it's, uh, there's going to be a few things you're going to have to remember, so this is one of them. Right. Okay, so let's consider the brain cancer data set which contains survival times for patients with primary brain tumors undergoing treatment. Okay, the predictors are, uh, I've, I've listed them there, G, uh, GTV, sex, the diagnosis category, location of the tumor, and something called Karnofsky index, and the, the method of, of, of um, radiation used, stereo. Now in this case, there's 88 patients, only 53 were survived to the end of the study. Okay, now suppose we wanna estimate the probability of surviving past 20 months, right? Well. The most obvious thing to do is to say, well, let's just look at the proportion of patients who survive past 20 months, right? Okay, this turns out to be 48 of the patients survive past 20 months of the 88, which that's 55%. So we might think the, the survival function at 20 is 55%, the probability of surviving past 20 months. But that doesn't seem quite right because 17 of the 40 patients didn't survive, who didn't survive were actually censored before that time. So we're calling anyone who's censored a death, and that is very pessimistic, right? So that this, this probability of 55% is probably too low. It's probably an underestimate, right? Because we're treating censored observations like, like there were deaths. On, conversely, if we, if we ignore the censored observations and if we, if we treat them as survivals till the end of the study, we would overestimate the probability. So we've got to find some way to deal with the censoring in sort of an unbiased way. 
Okay, so this is where Kappa and Amara come in. And we're now going to present the Kappa Meyer curve. And interesting, uh, Trevor and I actually we met Paul Meyer, if you remember, in the biostatistics workshop in the 80s at Stanford. And this paper is interesting. First of all, this paper is probably the most cited paper in all statistics in, in history. But it was kind of a forced marriage. Like uh, Kaplan and Meyer, independently, not working together, uh, submitted papers on, on, on what's now the Kaplan Meyer method to, to JAZA, the Journal of the Statistical so American Statistical Association. John Tukey, the editor, famous statistician himself, got these two papers and said, these guys are doing the same thing. They have to write a paper together. So it's kind of a forced marriage. Um, they had not even worked together, but it turned out to be a happy ending because now this paper is like a, a fundamental paper in statistics and survival analysis. Tukey was quite an authority. Only he could <laughs> say things like that. Yes, and actually Paul Meyer told us he wasn't very happy about it at the time, but I think uh, you know, both, both authors contributed and the result was a, a blockbuster paper. So uh, I'm just going to show the Kappa Meyer estimate in pictures that the details are in the, t in the textbook, but here's, here's an example. So I've got five patients here, okay? And the, so the patient number one died at time Y1. So how the Kappa Meyer estimate proceeds, it kind of unfolds in time. One goes to, to, to the first failure time, the first death, and four of the five patients survive past Y1. So the, the, the probability of surviving past Y1 is estimated to be four-fifths. Okay. Then we move on to the next failure time. Notice we skip this censoring time because it's, it's not important for this calculation, although it's going to come in here. Well, there's, there's three patients remaining, one, two, three. Two of the three survive past Y3, so the probability of surviving past Y3 is two-thirds. So overall, the probability of surviving past Y3 is four-fifths from the first times two-thirds from the second event. So what this method does is it computes that the conditional probability of surviving past each failure time, given you survived up to that time. So it's a series of conditional probabilities, and we just multiply them together, right? Because to survive past here, you have to survive past here, that's the first hurdle, and then you have to survive the next hurdle at, y, at Y3. And finally, Y5 is the last failure. No one of the one, per, the only one person made it, is at, is at risk here, and zero made it past, so the probability of, of surviving past Y5 is zero, so the overall probability ends up down at zero. So a very clever way of yeah. taking into account the censoring right. and using as much of the censoring information as you can, right. because they go into the denominators of these probabilities. Right, so this guy, he didn't get his own estimate, but he participated in the risks in the, in the calculation here, he dropped out here, so he didn't participate here. So the, the censored observations participate as long as they're in the study, basically, which seems perfectly reasonable. It's a, it's a very simple idea, but in retrospect, you know, fantastic. And often the best ideas are simple. And here's, here's result, the result in Kaplan-Meier curve. Of course, here we only have five observations, um, three events. Yeah. Generally, you'll have much more, and it'll be a, a smoother-looking curve. And there, there we go. There is such an example for the brain cancer data. Here's the Kaplan Meyer curve, along with standard errors, which are gotten from something called Greenwood's formula. And you can see it's a sort of stepwise function, which, and there's a little step down in each of the the, the uh, failures that occurred in this, this study. So the estimated probability at 20 months from the Kaplan Meyer is 71% which is quite a bit higher than the 55%, which we concluded before if we, if we assume the censored observations were deaths, right? But the 71% the is a, a much better estimate. So there's a big difference. Yeah. So the Kaplan-Meier curve is a very important uh, summary of the data, and any study in survival analysis will start with the Kaplan-Meier curve.